please welcome Executive Vice President of Artificial Intelligence and Research Development, Dr. Harry Shum. Hello. Well, I hope you all feel good after having lunch. And it's really great to see you all here. And uh, BUILD has uh, become my favorite conference every year. Uh, again, I want to thank you for choosing uh, my session here. I know you do have choices, so I'm going to promise you to make it worthwhile by cutting out all my jokes. <laughs> so this morning, Satya and Scott have talked a lot about Microsoft's worldview. That is intelligent cloud, intelligent edge, infused by AI. So the way we are going to deliver on this vision is through Azure. Azure is the best cloud offering out there for intelligence. So what will power all of this is actually our AI investment and our AI technology. And this is what I'm going to talk to you today. So we know that as developers, you know, you have many, many challenges in developing your AI applications, whether it's actually infusing AI into your existing applications in your enterprise, or using this new thing called the conversational AI to change how your company interacts with your own employees and your customers. So we want you to know that all our AI investments are really here to help you to make your life easier to develop your AI app. So there are really five things I want to convey to you this afternoon. And I want to make sure that you understand that you know, our AI services, AI products, AI platforms, and AI infrastructure will deliver the best offering out there in the industry. Let me start with the first one. So the first one is what we call the pre built cloud and edge AI services. Many of you have already tried our cognitive services since we launched three years ago at the build. Thank you very much for trying those services. I still remember three years ago when I launched it, we had only three, four services that time. Today, a million developers are using our cognitive services. And our goal this year is to be fully enterprise compliant, you know, with all those compliance built in by end of 2018. So let me show you how one of our customers, Volcom Steel, is using cognitive services on the edge. Let's play the video. Vulcan is a steel distribution company based in New Zealand and Australia. Our sites are inherently risky based on the weight of the material that we're moving uh, and as a result we do have to have a constant focus on safety in our work environment. The light bulb moment for us in this was when I attended Microsoft Ignite in Auckland and went to a cognitive services session and started working out that there was real potential to use artificial intelligence to learn about unsafe behaviour. We're mounting cameras on the backs of trucks, powered by AI, processing footage at the edge, detecting health and safety violations in the loading and unloading of trucks. The system is triggered by a video being uploaded into Azure Blob Storage. This also enters a row into Cosmos DB. This is picked up by an Azure function which spins up a number of VMs to run the AI model. The AI model recognises key frames of interest and enters them back into Cosmos DB in relation to the video. This is forwarded to a universal app for management to review and provide feedback loop into the system for further training. When a manager reviews the footage, if there is unsafe behaviour, it enables us to put an education program in place to teach the driver about safer practices. We're confident this will lead to a reduction in incidents. Artificial intelligence is going to have a significant impact in the health and safety space by enabling continuous learning and monitoring of the environment. I think you can imagine how powerful this could be you know, for so many different applications by leveraging those AI capabilities. So we provide the most comprehensive and the most customizable AI offering that runs across the cloud and the edge. We have 22 services, 14 are in GA and the eight are in preview. Specifically, we have 
just unified all our speech category to make it one offering with uh, speech service, machine translation, customer speech, and uh, our voice bots. Today, we are releasing additional advanced conversation services like uh, persona creation. We are also releasing a new service for custom voice that you can actually train with your own voice, recorded voice, your voice data set. And we are also adding options in custom vision that it has become a very popular service for us. So we, we're adding options in custom vision and uh, to deploy everywhere from the cloud to on-prem to mobile devices and uh, to Azure IoT. So now let me show you a really inspirational video about how some of the services have been used to help turn barriers into opportunities. Let's roll the video. I came to RIT because of the communication access that's provided here. We are the world's largest mainstream program for deaf and hard of hearing people. We have the world's largest interpreting services, as well as the captioning group. It's the largest, but we still cannot keep up with the growth and the need for access services. So we decided to use Microsoft Translator as an additional communication tool. As a deaf person, I want the exact same information that my hearing friends have. Presentation Translator was easier than we thought it would be. You really just have to click it, and the software automatically reads the content and everything that you have within the PowerPoint system. The Cognitive Services Custom Speech Recognition is critical for capturing vocabulary words that wouldn't be necessarily conventional in everyday life. Students can pick any language that they choose to receive the information. If the professor has chosen English, which they speak, then I can choose whatever language I learn in best. Do you guys play any video games? Students can use the app to initiate a conversation with others. So now that I have my phone, I can see exactly what was said. There are barriers to communication everywhere, but I think it's time we look at the barriers as opportunities, and then they can be broken down. It's uh, so exciting to see how our cognitive services are empowering people in real life. So now please help me to welcome Brian Treger, who you just saw in the video, to the stage to show you how this technology works. Brian. Brian, welcome. Hi, Harry. It's great to be here. As I was walking up, I think I might have heard people clapping, but I'm wondering if I can ask them to do it one more time. Did you know that deaf people, because we can't hear, the way that we show applause is by waving our hands? I'm wondering if everybody could try that with me. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Brian, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us. So I'm going to talk to you in Chinese, and uh, I wonder if your interpreter can understand the Chinese. Well, now we have a problem. I guess now, at least we have Microsoft Translator. <laughs> All right, I got some help. You know, it's technology. So it's really nice to be here. I'm used to the build conference, but usually I'm sitting over there. And I'm not sure I love being up here. Be careful. The You're probably right. Maybe even more forgiving than when I'm teaching students. Ning is a university Yes, I teach mobile app development at NTID, which is one of the colleges at the Rochester Institute of Technology. In particular, I teach German. Tai Hala. 
和人工智能相关吗 ？Yes, and as you can see, I'm also a user of artificial intelligence. At Rochester Institute of Technology, we collaborated with Microsoft and started using Presentation Translator last September. 是的，我们刚刚在视频中看到了令人振奋的成果。In the video, we focused on non-deaf teachers communicating with deaf students. What we are demonstrating today is a prototype of the adaptation of the acoustic model to my voice. Which is impacted by my deafness. In the community, we call this deaf voice. This enables the speech recognition to be almost as good as for people that are not deaf. So, the system is now completely tailored to your needs. Yes, from my voice to my vocabulary for speech recognition and translation. I could even create a custom text-to-speech voice in any language. 真的是难以置信。It is. Just a second. I think my phone is.、Uh... Not catching. Did they get translated? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. I keep going. <laughs> It is, and the collaboration between Rochester Institute of Technology and Microsoft has been fantastic. We can't wait to start using these new capabilities more and more in our school. 谢谢您的合作，今天非常高兴和您一起。Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Great job.、Yeah. Thanks again, Brian. It's just really, really incredible. I just want to make sure that you know both Brian and I were a bit nervous about showing this real-time demo you know, of our prototype. I just wanted to make sure that you understand what just happened there. So it includes a lot of technologies here, like a customization of acoustic models for specific voices, like Brian's.、Uh, it's actually not that easy to understand, you know, without the translation, and also noisy environments, you know, with echoes like here, and the language models and the machine translation for specific terminology like Zeremin, and also text-to-speech for creating unique voices. Now all of those technologies are available. Today, as part of this new unified speech service announced today, yeah, try it out, try it out. So let me move on to our next topic. You know how we deliver, how we are going to deliver conversational AI that is friendly, easy to use for the developers, easy to deploy for the enterprises, and loved by the users. So since Satya launched the Bob framework two years ago at the build, 300,000 developers have checked it out, and with more and more coming every day. Let me make it clear to you: if you are a developer today, you need to know how to build the bots. We are really seeing tremendous traction in the enterprises and the tremendous demand. It's really not just about a generic. Digital assistant, intelligent assistant, like Cortana, but even more so about the building special-purpose business bots. For example, for sales, marketing, customer support, and the customer services, it's absolutely the coming wave of innovation. And the bots are now the new apps. So let me invite Noel up 
to stage to walk you through an example of how our bot framework can create a new and a better user experience in Noel. Thank you for having me, Harry, and thank you guys for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Litware Lifestyle. This is a retailer, a brick and mortar retailer, that is trying to build a next generation customer experience for both their online and their physical stores. So you can already see on this site, if I scroll down a little bit, that there is a recommendations engine running here, right? So it's already using information about my purchase history, profile data, maybe some survey information to identify products that I might like. And you, using Azure ML, can build models just like this one. You'll also notice, just like Harry was saying, that there's a bot introduced in order to ease the friction of a customer when they're on the site. And we want to enable you and customers coming to sites using your bots to be able to use or talk to it any way they want to. For example, I might speak in Spanish, right? And say, hey, what do you sell? <laughs> or I might speak maybe in English. I'm from Miami, so I kind of switch back and forth <laughs> between the two, right? So if I say, I want a new watch, notice what happens. The bot's able to actually respond back to me in the language that I want to speak in. Now, you'll also notice what happened to the page. So in addition to translation, which is powered by our language understanding cognitive service, it's also able to identify intent. So you'll see here there, I, I typed in I want a new watch, and it used the word watch. It knew that watch was the most important thing and was able to generate a page that showed me smart watches, I had to take mine off, but normally I have one, so it's a pretty good understanding of what I would usually want to buy. However, today, I actually don't want that because I got a wedding and I want to buy a fancy watch. So instead, I need to tell it a kind of watch I do want. Now, yeah, sure, I could make a user type in all of the things like whatever, round, like I don't even know, I don't shop, like <laughs> I don't want to do that. I'd rather just find a picture that I like and use that instead. So why don't I do that? So I can now say, hey, do you know a picture? Were you like looking around? Did you find one you like? Give us that picture. And now we can use another cognitive service, custom vision, and a feature of custom vision, object detection, to not only take in that image, identify the object, in this case a watch, and extract that object. You'll see it up there in the upper left-hand corner. Then I can hand it off to Bing Visual Search, and it will look through the Litware product catalog and show me a few res results. But then I can even delight the customer even more, right? Build some trust and provide a series of options that are across the web, right? Pretty delightful. And I'm like, oh, actually, you know, thanks for showing me your competitors. That's so nice. But I do like this one. Why do I like it? Because it's called, you can't see it. I'll minimize it so you can see it. Manhattan. And I'm from Manhattan. I was born there, right? Yo, all right. It's my friends over here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to choose this one. However, being from Manhattan, I like to make sure I understand the return policy. <laughs> so let me check about that. Right, so what's the return policy? It says, oh, great, you got, what, seven days to return it? That's probably good, except I travel all the time for work. So I just want to know what happens if I need a little bit more time. <laughs> In this case, right, I'll say, okay, great. But that's not interesting, right? What is interesting about this, and notice this, is that I... In the very first part, right, asked very specifically about the return policy. But in the second question, not so much. So what's interesting about that is you can use another cognitive service that actually is GA today, Q&A Maker, to build and maintain interactions just like these. And you no longer need a expert development staff to do it, right? It's able to understand the intent of that first question without me having to do that. that I've worked on the non-Q&A version of this, and it's a really hard problem to solve, so this is pretty exciting. All right, so now, you know, I, I've, I've got the return policy, feeling pretty good about that, but I have four kids, so if there's a chance I could get out of the house and say, hey, I gotta go try this puppy on, I'm gonna do that. So let me go and ask. Now what's gonna happen here, and I'm gonna actually leverage a few services to do this, so stay with me. Um, the first one is I'm gonna use the Microsoft Graph API, we're gonna check 
right, which is a knowledge graph. We're just going to check not only for all associates, but we're also going to check for experts specific to the product that I'm looking at. Then I'm going to check their availability. I'll leverage uh, Azure location-based services to make sure that the, um, you know, the time zone and the location is correct. So you can see here, right, it went through and searched through 1,300 associates. It then grabbed the ones that were experts and then even identified a close store. Perfect. Is that okay? Seems fine. I would have even taken a longer drive if I could. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so now it's going to check my calendar and their calendar, right, or specifically the availability of those using that graph knowledge uh, API, and then say to me, what the, um, like I didn't say anything or touch anything. I love AI. Um, so it presented to me a bunch of different options, right? You'll notice it presented, even at the top, I think it said 8 to 9 a.m. Um, is tough traffic time. All right, so what I will do is say, yeah, sure, I'm interested. I don't want to tr drive when it's, oh, the last one that I used was Maps Distance uh, or Bing Maps Distance Matrix. Because not only do I want to like provide a, li a, a list of closed stores, but I also want to make the route frictionless, right? Make sure I edit, identify traffic, just make it super easy for the customer to get where they're going. All right, so I'm going to choose 11 o'clock. Now it's going to go through the process of actually creating that appointment. Great. Thank you very much. And then it's going to ask me a very interesting question. Take a selfie, because people love to do that. Right? I know I do. Um, and why is it going to do that? Because later, in just one, a couple seconds, we're going to enter the store, and we want the store to be able to recognize the user. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Oh, there I am. Well, Okay, I'm sorry, it's so exciting. Okay, I totally think they'll know who I am. <laughs> That's like awesome, please tweet that to me. Um, so cool. So now, once that happens, it says, great, here's an interactive map, be on your way. And I say, happily, we'll do so, leave my husband with the kiddos, and I'm out to the store. Now I enter into the store, and I'm going to need, or as I walk in, I start to see some of the advertising um, that is showing up. Maybe in a big kiosk, right? You've been to the mall and they have these kind of big kiosks with rolling ads. And I come in, but now something interesting is going to happen. I'm going to walk up to that advertisement and there's a camera that's going to look at me. It's then going to identify who I am. And as that happens, it's going to say, oh, you're female. Oh, your age range is this. Oh, you have purple shoes on, and it seems like you like this brand, right? We can identify brands through object detection. So now I can change that advertising as I'm looking at the kiosk to be relative to what I'm actually wearing right then. Apparently, sweatpants and a t-shirt or something, <laughs> right? Now I have a reason for being here, right? I'm actually here to communicate to someone about my watch. Hi, Nonel. How can I help you today? So what just happened here, right? It used, because there's a camera, it used Face API to identify who I was, right? Yeah, I probably wanted to walk in doing this, but it, got, it figured it out. And then once it had that information, it was able to personalize uh, a, a, a greeting to me. Now, what was special about this is the voice. The voice was created using one of our new services, um, the speech service, in order to create a custom voice for the business, which all of you may have an opportunity to do for your organizations. Now, it's not enough for us to be able to just hear the bot talk to me in a kiosk. I also want to be able to talk back. I'm here to try on a watch. Great. Alice is ready to help you. Follow the map to the jewelry department. So now it was able to use Bing speech, right? I went in, took that audio used the speech-to-text APIs to turn it into text so that my application could do something with it. In this case, it was able to identify a map and then even interlay that advertising right on top of it, custom to what I was maybe wearing that day. That's pretty cool. Um, now I'm headed off on my own way, but before I do that, I just want to mention a couple other things, right? One thing you could do is notice I hit a, a microphone button to speak. Oftentimes, the acoustic environment for bots can be a little tricky to play with if you're a developer and familiar with that. 
So we now have the ability for you to build in your own custom acoustic models. On top of that, you can even add in, which Harry mentioned earlier, the ability to create a custom language, right? Add to the default language model and add things like brand names, product names, service names, um, giving your store or your customer the ability to communicate in a natural way. So now I'm headed over to the store. The best thing we could do is equip the sales associate with as much information as possible. So let's head over and see what that looks like. You can imagine the associate on, you know, walking around with a surface and they get a ping going, hey, Noelle's in the house. And they see me, they see I'm a gold member, they realize they should take care of me, so they rush over. Um, but before rushing over, Alice wants to learn as much about me as possible. Right? So now we can use a product like Dynamics 365 to synthesize as much data into a single view as we can to be meaningful for that associate. So you can see we take the calendar information, my profile information, why I'm there, um, information, oh yes, most importantly, from our recommendations engine or model so that we can make sure we're enabling Alice to not only close the sale, but then even upsell right, the customer. So you can see with Microsoft AI, and intelligent retail, right? We have enabled the customer and the sales associate to have the best experience possible. Now, I know you're probably interested in the details on the bot, so we're gonna, we're gonna actually do that in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like to hand it back to Harry. I, I love this uh, uh, intelligent shopping scenario. I hope you are just as uh, convinced as I am uh, the boss are now the new apps. So we have uh, all kinds of tools to help you to build this boss. And in fact, we just uh, uh, announced this morning by Satya that we have over 100 new features in our bot framework. So I just give you a couple of examples, like uh, we just GA the cognitive services, Q&A maker. You can take a bunch of texts and turn them into question and answers. Now the bots can use them. Custom voice services personality chat, conversation learner, and many, many more, you should give it a try. The important thing we have realized after releasing and launching Bot Framework for three years is really the end-to-end -end experience that we can help the developers. It's not just about thinking about what bot you should build, or planning, and not even just about building the bot. It's really about the testing, publishing, releasing, and all the way to collecting the data and analytics and to help you how to revise and improve your body experience. So it's all those things that we actually have to really think through. So I'd like to invite my colleague Vishwak to come up here to show you some of our latest work to develop this end-to-end -end experience. Vishwak. Thanks, Harry. Azure Bot Service and Microsoft Bot Framework offer the most comprehensive experience for building conversational apps. An end-to-end -end bot development workflow includes planning, building, testing, publishing, connecting, and evaluation. Today, I'm excited to announce several new features to Microsoft Bot Framework and Azure Bot Service that span the end-to-end -end development workflow. With the new features announced today, you can start simple and quickly grow from a prototype to a production quality bot. You just saw the Litware lifestyle demo. In this demo, I'm gonna give you a tour of building that exact same bot using the new features we are announcing today. Let's jump right in. Bots are no different than applications and websites. For planning, you typically want to start by creating mockups of conversations between the bot and the user. Here in VS Code, I have a mockup of a simple greeting scenario. These are simple text files, so you can use any text editor you prefer. And here's another one for question and answer pairs. And here's one for product lookup. Chat files support rich attachments like cards and images, so you can mock up multimodal conversations. Once I have the chat files with a simple command line tool, I can convert them into conversation transcripts that I can view in the emulator and say hello 
to the brand new Microsoft Bot Framework v4 emulator available in preview today. I've loaded the transcripts that I've created. Here's the greeting one. Here's Q&A. And here's product lookup. Emulator renders the conversation transcripts using the web chat control. This is the exact same control that you can also embed within your own application or website. We have made it super easy for you to review your mock conversations using presentation mode in the emulator. OK, now imagine that your design, product management, and leadership team are happy with the plan, and you're just about ready to build your bot. Building your bot itself requires a bunch of different parts to be stitched together. Bot parts include language understanding, Q&A, dialogue, language generation, cognitive services like vision, speech, knowledge, and more. Azure Cognitive Services enable your bot to interact with your users in more human ways. Let's start by adding language understanding and Q&A capabilities to this bot. To help bootstrap language understanding for your bot, I have simple markdown-based language understanding files for every scenario we had identified during planning. So here's the one for greeting. Here are the question and answer pairs. And here's one for product lookup that even includes entity definitions. Markdown files are great for authoring, but services typically prefer JSON file format. So with a simple command line tool, I can parse all the language understanding files into Lewis and Q&A Maker JSON models. Today, I'm excited to announce that we are bringing the full power of Lewis.ai and Q&A Maker.ai to the command line. So with the Lewis and Q&A Maker tools, you can create, train, publish, and manage your models. OK, I have built trained and published my Lewis and Q&A Maker model. And I've written some code here using the brand new Bot Builder v4 SDK available in preview today. Bot Builder v4 SDK is an evolution over the v3 SDK. It enables you to start simple and layer in sophistication using a modular and extensible architecture. The new CLI tools and emulator make it super easy for you to track all the services that your bot depends on. As soon as I open my bot in the new emulator, I can immediately see the Lewis, Q&A Maker, and Azure Bot Service service references for my bot. And I can even deep link into these services from right here within the emulator. Let's go ahead and try and talk to this bot. Let's say I need a watch. Okay, that worked, and it looks good. Let's try something else. Can you get me a Rolex? And that did not work. Lewis had not seen the specific utterance before, so was not able to classify it with sufficient high confidence. One option for me is to go to the Lewis.ai portal to continue and refine my model, but the new emulator offers deep integration with Lewis and Q&A Maker. So if you look over under logs, I see a trace for the call out to Lewis. And when I click on it, I get a rich inspector that not only shows the actual results returned by Lewis, but there is more. I see that for this specific utterance, Lewis had classified this to be the non-intent. I can simply reassign the intent, train, and publish my model. And let's try that exact same thing again. Can you get me a Rolex? And that worked. Finally, I'm really happy to announce that Azure Bot Service is now available as an extension to the AZCLI 2.0. To wrap it all up, Azure Bot Service and Microsoft Bot Framework offer the most comprehensive experience for building your conversational app. Happy bot building, and we look forward to your feedback on the new CLI tools, emulator, and the bot builder SDK. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Vishwak. I hope you get a sense of you know, how easy it is, the tools that we offer, the new features, to help you to build the bots. And another very exciting thing I want to call out is the, our ability through our bot framework to, public, uh, to publish directly onto Cortana. So Cortana is on 148 million devices. It's a powerful distribution channel for bots and the skills. As you saw this morning you know, in Satya's the presentation, that Alexa and uh, Cortana now actually help each other to publishing in, in the respective channels. So I would really encourage you to think about, you know, as you build your bots, you know, Cortana is one very powerful channel that you can leverage. And the bot framework provides simple, high-quality tools to teach Cortana new capabilities, including productivity skills that many of you in the enterprise really care about. And the Cortana is available not only on PCs, but also on other mobile devices and the smart speakers. And in fact, our Cortana team is using bot framework, as you just saw from Visual demo, and the other tools like cognitive services to develop our own new first party skills. So okay, enough about the bots. Let me move on to the third topic I want to talk to you today. That's really about open AI platform and the tools. So it's very, very important for us to ask the question that why is open AI platform important to developers and for Microsoft? It's really about the speed of innovation and also about the convenience of developing AI applications and solutions by our developers like you. So several months ago, in partnership with Facebook, we launched Onyx, where any deep learning framework can work with any silicon and on any devices. So we're very, very excited to see the momentum. Already 15 companies, including Amazon, now support Onyx, and many more are talking to us. And the last week, we announced the support for PyTorch 1.0 in Azure Machine Learning Services and the Data Science Virtual Machine. Six of the top frameworks support Onyx with converters between each other. If you have more frameworks, bring them on. We'll help you. So we have taken Onyx to the next level to integrate into our tool chains, including BrainWave, GPUs, Windows ML. It's a great ecosystem with Onyx, offering great performance on optimized hardware, including 600 million Windows devices. But not only we have this open AI platform at Microsoft, we really have more tools to help you to build AI applications end-to-end. -to -end. In some cases, in addition to the pre built models, even though they're customizable, you may not feel that's enough. So you may want to create your own ML models. That's exactly why we actually have Azure Machine Learning there for you. So Azure Machine Learning helps you to build AI models with maximum productivity, and it integrates training for quick experimentation, and it closes the cycle, development cycle, you know, with production model monitoring and with all the analytics. So Azure Machine Learning is closely integrated with the rest of your overall development cycle. And for high-scale data preparation, you should consider using Azure Databricks to get your data to the right place. And for high-scale production of your already generated model, you can easily deploy to Azure Batch AI or use Azure Kubernetes services for unlimited horizontal scaling. I'd also like to talk a little bit specifically about what we are doing for our great community of .NET developers. So today, we are announcing a preview of ML.NET, an open source framework specialized for .NET developers. We are already using it ourselves in Windows, in Bing, and in Azure Teams, and under huge scalability and the performance requirements. 
it helps make you more productive throughout the entire ML workflow, starting from pre-processing, then to feature selection and feature engineering, to modeling, to evaluation. And an early version of ML.NET is now available at GitHub today. Please try it out and let us know. So now, let me invite you, Seth, let me invite Seth to come up stage to show you how all those things are coming together. Seth. How are you? How's everybody doing? So how many of you are looking at this stuff and thinking, my boss is gonna want me to make this when I get back to work? <laughs> Any raise of hands? How, how many of you have had your manager come in and be like, hey, we need to AI all the things? <laughs> and you're like, we already did. Don't tell him, Bill, right? That, I mean, I feel like this stuff is like kind of too magical. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the tools that we actually have to help you really put AI in applications. And notice that the first thing that I brought up was Visual Studio. Because I want you to actually see Visual Studio and how this actually works. Remember when we talk about AI, you can actually infuse AI in your applications with cognitive services right now. And I can show you how to do that in just a couple of clicks. And it's really easy because whenever you open Visual Studio the first time and you're writing your first project, there is a tremor of fear that goes through my soul that says I need to make something from nothing. But let me show you how we help you. I have some cognitive services already set up here. Uh, here's a computer vision service that I called Ra because I'm clever, right? Because all seeing eye? No? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and right click here. I'm going to show you how easy it is to create a new application. I'm going to call it something memorable that I'll remember next time. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, use, put it in my projects directory because that's where I put all the stuff. And I'm going to let the magic happen right away. Because when it comes to AI, oh, did it not work? Well, uh-oh, looks like I need to refresh my cognitive services because I did not log in. Bad person. Any of you have uh, like the keys on there too and you want to pull your keys? Anyone use cognitive services? It's amazing. You can literally just make the calls. But one of the things that I have a hard time with is I need to go back and forth to get the keys. But take a look at this. I can just look at the subscription keys now and pull them and put them in my app. All right, I'm going to try one more time to actually create the new application now that I'm logged in. I'm going to create, I'm going to name it something that I'll remember. Again, that was funny the second time too, wasn't it? No? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And it's going to go ahead and create the application. Notice that the status code actually did help me that time. It told me to log in. Rookie mistake. All right, notice that we actually write the code for you to call the API. There is no excuse for you not to go and use cognitive services right now. You can literally right click and do the thing. Notice over here I have the program. Uh, it, it, it has an image already in there so that I can literally just run it. So I'm going to run it. Remember, right click, make a new project, name it something interesting. It's saying, look, hit enter a couple times, and you're going to see some man staring at you weirdly underwater. It's okay. But you're also going to see the actual output from cognitive services. Many of you are wondering, well, that's cool, Seth, but how many of you have a forum? Or how many of you have people uploading pictures? What if you need to check? that the right things are in there. We have scores in there that say if it's something that's appropriate or not. You can use this right now, right now with a couple of clicks. Okay, well the other problem we have is like, okay, well Seth, Harry was talking about custom AI though, uh, and sometimes the blank screen is a problem, you know, when you gotta write the first thing. We actually help you out with that. If you look at AI tools right here, we have something called the Azure Machine Learning Gallery where you can actually load up a project and look at it and see how it runs and get a feel for how AI works. The other thing we have is if you look at file new project here, we have a whole node with AI tools where you can load up anything. Everyone always asks me, Seth, can I use TensorFlow? Can I use CNTK? Can I use CAFE? Can I use PyTorch? It's 1.0, it's coming out very soon. Yes, we are only interested in your clock cycles. Use them. Like use anything, anything you want. We are very happy that you use that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you a program that's kind of like the hello world of, um, the hello world of uh, data science or, or machine learning, and that's the digits program. So I'm going to go ahead and open my uh, project here. I have it in the C projects uh, folder. I'm going to hit uh, enter. And notice that I have this digits program with the Z because I am a hipster, or at least I 
try to play one on TV, right? Notice I have here two projects. One is a Python project for actually running a convolutional neural network to train. I'm going to train it in front of you. Okay, so you can see that there's nothing up my sleeves. In fact, I didn't even wear sleeves for that very purpose. I'm going to go ahead and right click and run this program that actually, let me, let's see, debug, uh, start new instance, to show you what this program actually does. And I'm going to draw a number here. Let's say the number three. Okay, that's the number three. Let's see what it does. Three. Good. So I'm going to show you how to build that from scratch. I scratched every one of the bits that you're going to see right now I made myself. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to run this. And notice there's a breakpoint. I'm going to run this. I'm going to set this off to the side. And then while it's running, I'm going to explain to you what it is that is being built. Okay, in Visual Studio, notice that I'm using Python because that's the language of data science that in R. And so if you're comfortable using Python and you want to build machine learning models using Python, it's already there ready for you to go. The thing that I actually built here was a convolutional neural network that takes images and creates a network of things. I'll show you. Imagine a picture. In your head, you see a picture. The computer, all the computer sees is a bunch of numbers. OK, so it hit the break point. And I'll get back to my story here. Just like you would in any other program, you can actually run it. You can see the variables in Visual Studio. OK, now it's going to run, because I'm actually going to run the actual model. What it's doing is it's taking a bunch of pictures. And as you look at pictures, what we see is we see colors. But the computer sees numbers. Numbers. And I am going to take the lid off of AI and tell you the secret of how, what AI is actually doing. Like literally, if I say blockchain at the end of my session, you could make millions with AI. And I'm not going to talk about blockchain. <laughs> so let me tell you, all we're doing is we're taking an image and we're multiplying it by a bunch of numbers in a very large network structure. That's it. And it turns out that we, the first set of numbers that we have, we guess. They're random numbers. And then we let the computer go through all of the examples of the images and refine those numbers that we multiply. So if you have a pixel that's 255, it's going to go into a node that multiplies it by a minus one or by a plus one. And you're going to have a whole bunch of these. So it turns out that the secret to AI is you're literally learning a bunch of numbers in a graph structure. It's not as exciting as everyone says. But then again, I am the engineer. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? Make it work. OK, so it's almost done. Notice that it's going through the process of optimizing the cost function. The cost function is telling you how bad or how well it's doing or not doing. right? One of the cool things about this, and this particular model did not run as well as I would have liked, and I'll show you why. I'm going to go ahead and right click and run TensorBoard. And I'm going to pick the, I'm going to pick the learn digits, and I have some output here. Now again, people ask me, I think I picked the wrong, uh, the wrong node. So I'm going to right click again and run TensorBoard, and I think I need to pick the logs. There you go. That's a better one. I ran this a couple of times, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, because with data science, it's all about science, which literally means glorified guess and check. And so you're going to be going through this process a lot. Notice that in this particular model, the last one I did did not do as well. Something is wrong. And notice that I can see it right away. And I'm using open source tools directly from Visual Studio. The model before looks like it was learning a little bit better. The model that I ran the first time looks like that one learned the most, but 84% is still, 89% is still not very good. Notice that you're going to go through this process a lot. And you're going to say, well, Seth, but wait a minute. I don't have a fancy GPU like you do. That's OK, because in the cloud, we have all sorts of fancy GPUs for you to use. So this same job that I just ran, I'm going to show you how to run directly here. Let me put Control C, directly inside of the cloud. Right click. Submit job, OK? And I am just going to give it a descriptive name of the job. And I am going to go ahead and hit Submit. What is this actually submitting to? Well, it's submitting to this here uh, a VM in the cloud that has four GPUs. I'm going to show you what's called the heat map. Let me set the refresh rate to 5. And I'm going to describe what it is that it's doing. And what's going to happen is eventually you're going to see one of the GPUs light up. And so as soon as you do, make sure you clap a little bit so that I know to talk about it. Because just like Martha Stewart, we've got to put some in the oven and we've got to tend something else. right? 
I'm gonna show you a little bit more about this because look, you can right click, you can browse exactly what's happening on the job. And just like every other project that you work on as a developer, things are not gonna work. And that's okay, right? We have these VMs for you so that you can actually run a bunch of jobs, right? And these jobs will run over and over as many times as you need. And you can run them in the cloud with the power of four GPUs. Let me go back to the heat map. Okay, so this is gonna, again, it's submitting a job into the cloud and it's going to do that. Not only can you submit jobs to specific VMs, because everyone asks me, Seth, can I use this or that or this? Yes, it's a machine you're renting from us. You can run whatever you want on it that's legal. The lawyers told me to say that, so I'm going to check that off. But we have other things that you can run. For example, Batch AI, Azure Batch AI. And marketing wanted me to get this exactly right. So Azure Batch AI helps you experiment with your AI models using any framework and then train them at scale across GPU and CPU clusters. Okay. So now you can see, you were supposed to clap when you saw the red. Now you can see this model actually running on a virtual machine in the cloud, right? Running in there. And the model is, it, I mean, you can see everything that's going on. In fact, I can right click, I already did that. You can see in the job browser, you can see all the warnings that are coming out of there. You can also look at the standard out Right, I'm going to go ahead and open that with Visual Studio Code. And you can see everything that's happening as if it was your own machine. Right? Look at this one. This one's actually a lot better because, again, it's running in the cloud. My other one didn't work, right? I don't know why. Okay, so let me run through now this model because one of the important things to recognize is that when you're building these things, you're actually building a thing called a model. And let me show you what that thing actually is. So this is the last one I built. I'm gonna go ahead and right click, and I'm gonna view the model. And when I open this up, it opens an open source tool called Netron, and this is the thing, the graph with all of the numbers inside of it. And if I, if I zoom in a little bit, I think that's the most I can zoom in. You can see the picture coming in. You can see the shape coming out. You can see the things that are gonna be multiplied. You're gonna see things that are being added together. It's literally a, a network of numbers that you multiply together. And so when you're, when you're running these things, think of the output, the model, as a resource that you bring into other programs. And so again, here you can see, oh, no. No, Netron, I don't want to upgrade you. I'm doing a session. You can see here I brought the, the, I brought the model directly over as a resource, and I copy it directly into the output folder. And now when I run this program, I'm actually going to set a breakpoint. And I'm using here an open source uh, framework called TensorFlow Sharp. In this case, you can see that I'm, I'm pulling an image and I'm doing the regular math things to convert the image into the right shape. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit a breakpoint right here and I'm gonna run this thing to show you what is actually happening. Okay, so debug and I'm gonna start new instance. All right, so here is the digit written, writing program that we saw earlier. I'm gonna write the number three here and I'm gonna hit recognize and it's gonna hit the breakpoint. Now. If you look at the output window, you are going to see, because I made sure of it, what the computer sees. It's just numbers. And then we flatten them out, and then we pass them through that graph of numbers that the computer learned, and then it outputs a set of numbers. And these numbers are gonna be zero through nine. And let me show you what that looks like. It turns out that the number that's the highest is the one that we return. And which one's the highest, is it three? Here, I'll run it. Looks like it is. I am gonna write another number like really badly. <laughs> what does it think it is? Uh, it's not sure. And you're probably wondering, well Seth, why are you gonna show me a bad example of something? Because this is important. If that's supposed to be a nine and it's never used that picture to optimize its network, guess what? It's not gonna work. And so now if you start to think about AI in, process, in terms of, well, I need to give it that picture and run it through the process again. Yes. I need to run the training as many times as I can with as many new things. Yes. And then you have this network that's powerful and that you can update and put into a DevOps pipeline. And now, once anything gets into the Donovan Brown space, this is real engineering, man. Once it's in the DevOps, it becomes real. Now, the last thing I want to say is, is super important 
because you saw Harry said, Seth, Onyx is the new stuff, or he's telling all of us, Onyx is the new hotness. You can use Onyx to transfer these resources everywhere. You can use them here. You can put them in WinML. You can put them in, in, uh, in uh, CoreML. You can run them on Windows. But Seth, this is a, this is a TensorFlow, TensorFlow protobuf file. I want to put it in Onyx. Well, we've got you covered there too. If you go to Model Tools, you can do this thing called Convert Model, and you can take any one of the models that you built and convert them directly to Onyx so you have maximum portability. We are really about open source. We are really about helping you do AI, the real kind, not the fried froth. This is real engineering, something you can do today. And with these tools that we're letting you use and that we have and we're excited to give to you, the sky's the limit with what you can do in AI. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I have to confess, I can't watch Seth's demo forever. <laughs> yeah, I do need to move on to the, the, the fourth point I want to uh, talk to you. Uh, that is actually about AI infrastructure. In particular, the need for real-time AI infrastructure. Today, you know, you, when you run AI applications, especially you know, some of your AI applications are really time critical and the like image recognition or speech recognition. And very likely, you actually have to make a trade-off between the batch size and the performance. But no longer. So we actually have ways to help you. This morning, you heard Satya talk about the project Brainwave. Uh, that is really about enabling real-time AI that uses our most advanced FPGA infrastructure in Azure, where chips get a near full utilization on single requests. So I'm going to show you this chart here, and hopefully you get this idea very quickly. It really shows the uh, performance comparison using Brainwave uh, versus using a throughput optimized NPU, you know, the typical of many of those DNN accelerators today on the market. Most of other AI chips optimize throughput at the expense of latency, which is understandable typically by batching multiple independent requests you know, together you know, so that you, know, you can actually get this kind of high performance as you can see from the beginning of the graph here. And on the other hand, Brainwave can get that you know, across, just the all, all across there. The same performance in you know, real time, you know, whether it's single or whether it's actually much bigger batch out there. So this is really a great innovation that we have been working on at Microsoft Research over a long time, and I'm so super excited about that you know, with Satya's announcement this morning. But it doesn't necessarily stop you know, in the cloud. And the FPGA technology, what we showed with uh, Project Brainwave, through partnership, you know, we can also deliver FPGA on the Azure stack on-prem. All of that power can actually now be available, not in the cloud, but also can be pushed onto the edge. As you can imagine, you know, many, many new applications you know, become possible with this technology. So we're super excited about the AI infrastructure. So finally, the last thing I want to talk to you is the Microsoft research and the AI resources that we are making available to you. So you have seen a lot in the morning, now also in this session. It's a lot of exciting things that we are doing. But a very important thing I want you to think about is that, what do you do to prepare for the future? So I want you to know that Microsoft is committed to continue to advance the state of art in AI and the computer science. We will be your technology partner that you can trust and they depend on over a long period of time. I want to share a little bit of history with you that in fact we started Microsoft Research 27 years ago. When we started, first the three groups we ever started were all in AI, natural language processing group, speech technology group, and the computer vision group. So we have actually done a lot over the years and we have driven some incredible progress in AI areas. So I want to share a couple of pictures with you that you already saw this morning in a different version from Satya's keynote. So many of those problems, AI problems from perception to cognition, that looked 
unsolvable only a few years ago. Now we actually believe we can address them. The first example I show you is actually in the area of computer vision. You know, we, we're gradually approaching human parity. And the two years ago, with the invention of ResNets, using 152 layers of deep neural nets, we were able to accomplish 96% of accuracy on ImageNet. So that year, we won three categories of ImageNet competition. And that is just as good as the Stanford graduate student recognition rate. Well, it's not that easy. And uh, no, last year, you know, we actually accomplished something truly extraordinary in speech recognition. Using the standard switchboard data set, we were able to reduce the error rate to 5.1%. That's unthinkable, even a few years ago. And that's not just the ordinary people like us in the room. That this is our error rate you know, from this phone you know, conversations that are collected. That is actually the error rate for those professionals who do transcription. And in January, you know, we also accomplished something you know, together with a few other groups that we reached the kind of human parity in terms of machine reading comprehension, that you have a question to get the answer using the Stanford question and answer data set called the SQUAD. And uh, just uh, you know, two months ago, and we also announced that for Chinese to English and English to Chinese, of news data set, again, we accomplished human parity. That is really also amazing. And of course, you should take all this kind of accomplishments with a grain of salt. Those are only parity for specific data sets and the specific tasks. Reaching true human parity in perception and cognition is going to take us a long, long time. But make no mistake, we continue to make incredible progress there. And also, just as Satya said, it's not about, in a way, bragging about unbelievable research accomplishments. What truly matters is turn those technologies into tools and the frameworks that our developers can use and the application we can build, as you saw from Brian and my demo earlier. So you will be able to take advantage of our breakthrough work. For example, today, we are announcing AI Lab which helps enable our growing community of AI developers to share their AI experiments. At the AI lab, you can get access to videos, the ability to test and experiment, and the source code on GitHub, research papers from Microsoft and other places, and a link to our AI school online trainings. So of course, it's still relatively early in the AI development and the innovation cycle. You, know, you and all of us should expect more. So we are going to keep you connected with our innovation engine, that is Microsoft Research. So for one last demo, let me invite Sonia to the stage to show off something really, really cool that you can use through AI Lab. Sonia. Thank you so much, Harry. All right, be honest, who's excited? Woo! Woo! Awesome. So we decided to, um, in order to bring AI on the edge to reality and to show you how you can have some fun with it, we uh, created this little challenge called the Search and Rescue Challenge. Uh, so let's roll a clip and show you what it's all about. Obviously, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I think it brings AI on the edge to reality. And so what we've got here is the M210, the Matrice 210 from DJI. And we've actually um, 
put on some custom boards on top. And so we're running an NVIDIA GPU and a couple of custom uh, OS boards right here. And it, once the model gets loaded on here, it actually real-time inferences on the images that are coming through from this camera. So that's pretty, pretty neat stuff. Um, so let's give you a little bit of a taste of what you'll be doing in this challenge, should you choose to accept the mission. Cool, so I'm here in an Azure VM that's powered by GPUs, and I'm gonna spin up AirSim, which is a simulation environment that we use to generate synthetic training data. So let me just kick that off real quick. Um, and in order to interact with AirSim, I'm actually doing it through a Python script. So let's get that guy going. And what you'll see it doing is it's actually telling the drone to fly through our 3D generated environment. And so we took a couple of pictures of the Microsoft soccer field. We dropped some of our furry lost animals on it. Um, and then we 3D rendered it using the Unreal Engine into AirSim. Now you can imagine, as fun as this scenario is, in a real life search and rescue or even disaster recovery scenario, it's often super dangerous and also costly to get the real images that you need for your environment in order to train your vision model. So with AirSim, we're able to actually train the model on synthetic data. And so what the script is having the drone in the virtual environment doing right now is it's found the sheep and it's now orbiting around the sheep taking pictures and you can see that down here in our Python script, right? And so we're saving all of those synthetic images from our environment, and next you'll see me use it to train our custom vision model in a second. And so with Python, it, it's actually uh, pretty quick and easy, and we've provided the script for you if you do uh, engage in the challenge. And so here, we're doing some higher order math uh, to get the drone flying, because there's a real physics engine behind AirSim that uh, emulates reality, right? So you have to do all the same great physics rules and uh, that you would do in real life. So we're adjusting some of the positioning of the drone. And then here, the images that are saved, we're actually cropping them to optimize for custom vision and to create images, synthetic images that the model would then use that are more accurate. And then from there, we're saving them off. And here's where you'll see we have our animals definition. So right now, we've only included the black sheep. It'll be up to you to include all of the other ones to help find them. Um, and then here is where it actually says to orbit the position. So let's see what we came up with. Fantastic. So what you'll see is we've actually got synthetic pictures of our sheep from all different angles. And in this Python script, what you can do is you can actually play around with some other environmental variables, like how quickly the drone orbits around the animal, what angle and what degree, what distance from the animal. So there's a lot of different environmental things you can play around with that gives you a lot more flexibility, again, than real world would give you. So I will now copy these guys back to my desktop, because I've got all of the good uh, IoT Edge deployment things loaded locally. So there we go, there's our training images, and now I'm gonna switch over into the custom vision portal. So custom vision allows you to super quickly create a custom vision model by basically training it on some image data that you give, and we've provided it all of the animals except the sheep, and so here you'll see we've only given it one real world image. So let's help to train the model a little bit more. We're gonna add all of those good ones that we just gathered from AirSim. And then we're gonna tag them to tell the model that it is a sheep. And now that it's uploaded it, let's retrain our model. And you can see how quickly and easily I can get this done. Now if I were, if I were to do this with um, machine learning Deep framework, for example, it would take me a lot longer to actually create my neural network to process those images, but also I'd need to have a ton more images, right, in the thousands. Here what you saw is we're actually only using, um, I'm gonna say roughly 280 images to train this model, which is great. So we see we've got a pretty good recall and precision on this guy, so let's do a quick test. And I've got, obviously, my training separated from my test images. This is a new one. And with 87.6% probability, it, the model realizes that this is actually a sheep. What else is super cool is I'm actually using a real-world image to test against synthetic data.
right? So that's the power of the simulation environment. Cool, now, now you're asking yourself, how do I get my model from custom vision onto that drone? Well, that's the next cool piece. So custom vision allows you to export your model into any format. We are the most open cloud provider of any. We let you take your model with you wherever you go, and also in any format that you need it in. So depending on where you're actually going to be running it, you have many options. And as Seth and Harry also pointed out, Onyx is the new hotness, so you're able to export directly from here into Onyx. For the drone, because it is running uh, Linux um, on the cards and we need to dockerize our model, I'm actually gonna export to TensorFlow. Give that guy just a quick second to run. And we're gonna download. And what I need to do is just replace it. So I've got my app that's gonna be running on the drone. And in this image classifier app, I've got this model file. Actually, let me grab those first. Nope, here. So there's my zip of my model. And I've got my two files, the PB and the labels.txt. I'm gonna get it over into here and just replace them. Now that we've refined the model with the sheep, it'll be able to actually recognize the sheep. And switching over into VS Code, now that we've got all of our updates in, I've got this deployment.template.json. And all I have to do to create my IoT Edge solution is right click and then build the IoT Edge solution. And that'll go through fairly quickly. Cool, that's done. And then this deployment.json is the one that actually creates the deployment for the Edge device. So we click on that. And right inside of Visual Studio Code, you'll see we have several options of where to deploy this. We've got our simulation environments, which could be any local desktop or VM, really. And then we've also got our drone. So I'll select our M210. Great, deployment successful. And so now next time this drone goes online, it will hook up into Azure IoT Hub and pull down that model right away and just run it. So hopefully you guys are, thank you. So hopefully you're just as excited about this and getting hands on with it as we are. Come visit us in the TCC into Homo room number four and come win a t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Uh, it's really fantastic demo. You know, it's very exciting. You know, the, really, I, I hope you know you will. Uh, you for all your developers, I encourage you to participate uh, in this drone challenge. And I might even see you in the Microsoft Soccer Field. Uh, Sonia just talked about it, and uh, you should have fun and get inspired and become unicorns. So there's uh, the tons of other great resources that we have available for you. Uh, if you want to learn more about AI, you can visit our AI school and uh, take any of those online courses free and uh, follow many tutorials to learn concepts and other things. Um, so there are a lot of great sessions on, uh, in this conference in Build this week. I highly recommend in the two uh, sessions by Erica Boyd and uh, Joseph Soroshi. Uh, they will go even much deeper and on AI so it's really great to have spent this session with you today. Uh, let me remind you what we talked about this afternoon. It's always about you know, what we can bring to you, you know, what Microsoft you know, has been you know, really build those tools for you. So we started with cloud and edge AI services. Please try cognitive services and let us know. Friendly conversational AI is all about the bot framework. Uh, it's everywhere. You should use bot framework and all other tools like Louis to build your bots. Open AI platform and the tools, and the think about you know, Onyx and other things that you can really use. And the real-time AI infrastructure, you know, whether it's Azure GPU farms or for, for modeling or for inferencing, you know, Project Brainwave and the FPGA and the real-time AI capabilities. And of course, you know, Microsoft Research and AI resources that we have here for you. Again, you know, everything we do here is to help our developers and Microsoft has been increasingly recognized as one of the leaders in AI and the machine learning and a trusted technology partner. So to close, let me go back to where Satya started. We believe that Azure is the best cloud for AI. It's that simple. Thank you very much. Enjoy a great field conference. Thank you.